Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. This lesson is part of an extended series on hypothesis testing in the analyze phase. In this lesson, I'll review the multiple regression test and general linear model, or GLM, which measure relationships between more than two factors. I'll spend the first part of this lesson reviewing some of the critical concepts that can help you to understand how to use these tests. But despite that, I recommend that you at least review the prior lessons on hypothesis testing if you haven't already done so. But for now, let's review again why we even need hypothesis testing. Well, we need hypothesis testing because, remember, our goal for the project is to resolve the problem by first building a transfer function. We don't want to just alleviate the symptoms that we're seeing, but we want to get to the root cause. You may recall my example of my daughter, Hannah. We don't want to just alleviate the arthritis pain that she was feeling in her leg, but we want to heal the root cause, which was the strep throat. So if we don't know what the root cause is, then that means we need to build a transfer function to figure that out. By building the transfer function, we can know what changes, that is, what improvements that we need to make that should fix that root cause. Now if you recall, the transfer function is defined as y equals f of x. That is, the output response of y is a function of one or more input x's. It's part of the IPO flow model, again, that we described before in the IPO flow model, where we have an input that leads to a process and an output. Well, the y refers to that output. The process piece refers to the function that's applied to an x, the x being the inputs that are part of it. So it's really expressed in the IPO flow model to an equation. Asian. Now, how does this transfer function fit with hypothesis testing? Well, hypothesis testing tells us which of those x's, which of those inputs that we're looking at, are independently influencing the y, the output metric. When we reject a null hypothesis, we're building evidence proving which x's are guilty of driving the y. And while what we'll do at the end is we'll compile all the evidence in the improved phase of DMAIC, and that's when we'll begin to fix those root causes or come up with a plan that's going to fix those root causes now that we know from the hypothesis testing which of the X's are the most critical X's that have the most influence and where we need to make the biggest changes that are going to affect our output Y. Okay, now let's review again the various steps we follow when doing hypothesis testing. On a high level, the steps begin with a four-step process, which was starting with a practical problem. We're stating the problem as a yes or no question, and then we want to convert that problem into a statistical problem. That's going to help us to figure out which is the right statistical tool or method we're going to use to help figure out how we're going to do the analysis. And then we apply that statistical tool or concept on it, and then we interpret the results from that and come up with some analytical answer. And then from that, we would interpret the analytical answer into some practical solution or some practical way in applying that so it makes sense to us. And at the heart of doing the hypothesis testing, again, for steps two or three, that's where we drill down to six additional sub-processes or sub-steps in order to figure that out. So it started off with defining the objective. Then we want to state the null and the alternative hypotheses. Then we want to define the confidence level and the power levels based off of the alpha and beta risks that were identified collect the sample data and we want to calculate the p-value. All these are part of building this statistical problem. And then once we've done that and run the test, then we interpret the results. This is going to be the point where we decide whether we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis. This is what we'd follow when we want to go through the formal hypothesis testing. All right, now let's review again the chart for finding the right statistical test and where the multiple regression and GLM fit into all this. As we look at the familiar drill down for finding the right statistical test, we'll be reminded that the values we're looking at are when we answer this first question and saying that the data type for both values you're comparing are going to be continuous values or numerical type of values that will draw us down to this area where we're going to be looking at relationships. And specifically, we're going to be comparing two or more factors. Unlike before, where we had the comparison of just one factor against another one at a time, in this case, we're saying where we're doing simultaneously two or more factors that we're comparing, it could be the multiple regression or the general linear model, also referred to as GLM, that we would use for these types of tests. And this is what we're going to be covering in this lesson. OK, now let's talk about how you can run the multiple regression test from within Minitab. Well, for the multiple regression test, that's when we want to build a regression equation by comparing more than two continuous values at a time to understand how they're correlated with each other. So in order to run this test, we're going to go to the stat menu, select regression, and then select regression again. 
The inputs for this test it looks like this for the dialog box that's opened up for the mini tab. And then here you're going to select the primary continuous value, the primary Y value that you're going to be selecting, as well as all the other continuous values that you're going to be comparing those against as the predictors. As well, you would select the graphs button, and from there you can select the 4 and 1 option in order to see the residual plots related to this type of test. Okay, now let's walk through an example using the multiple regression test. For this multiple regression test, we're going to use several continuous values that we're going to compare. So I'm going to refer back to the mini tab sample data file that's provided on the website. And from there, we're going to ask ourselves the practical problem is seeing is there a relationship between any of the continuous values that are within that sample data file? If there is a relationship, then how strong is that relationship? So our statistical problem is going to look like this. We're first going to state the null and alternative hypotheses where we'll say that for the null hypothesis, we'll presume that there's no correlation at all between the comparisons versus the alternative saying that there is some sort of relationship between them, again, where the R squared value is going to be greater than zero. So for the confidence and power levels, we're going to use the default value of 95% for a confidence level and 90% for the power level. And for the statistical problem that we're going to be typing in the mini tab, we'll go to the stat menu, select regression, and then select regression again. And in the variables box, that's where we're going to select at least five of the different metrics that we know of that are continuous values in the sample data file. That is metric A, B, C, D, and E from the list of columns that are available. And also select the graphs button, and from within there, choose the four and one so that we can look at the residuals for that. Now for the statistical solution, when you run this test, this is the typical output that you would see in Minitab and the results from this test. Now each continuous value that you selected is tested against metric A, which was the one that was selected as the response value. And then we would still, as we do for all tests, look for the p-value. Since this p-value is less than our alpha risk value of 5%, then we reject the null hypothesis. Or in other words, we're saying that we're going to accept the alternative hypothesis. That is, that there is some relationship between these continuous values that we're comparing. Then we would also, since we know there's a relationship, can look to the R-squared or the R-squared adjusted values. Here the R-squared adjusted, again, the adjusted means that it's accounting for the number of variables that are included. And this is 94.8%. It's a little bit less, but it's still very close to the regular R-squared value. So that gives us confidence. We have enough data points that we're looking at. But the R-squared adjusted is very high. It's uh, almost 95%. So that would suggest that there's a strong correlation. Now, of the variables that we're comparing here again, metric A is going to be our primary response value, the Y that we're looking at. And then it does a separation here between the comparison of metric B, C, D, and E, and identifies a p-value for each one of these. So the variables that have been tested, you'll notice that metric E is the only one that has a p-value that is less than the alpha risk of 5%. The other ones have a p-value, now it's the constant, you wouldn't really use it as a comparison because that's not one of the the continuous values that we're testing for. But as far as for metric B, C, and D, all those have a p-value that's much greater than our alpha risk. So in this case, it seems to be that metric E is the only one that's driving most of this. So from a practical standpoint and how we, we would explore this, we would say that about 95% of the relationship can be explained between the tested factors that we're looking at. But most of that seems to be driven by metric E. So the way we can really test that for sure is we can rerun the test with just metric E and metric A. And what we should see is that the p-value is also going to be very low, and the r-squared value or the r-squared adjusted is probably going to remain unchanged. And again, the reason is because we're seeing that metric E seems to have the lowest p-value and is probably driving most of the relationship that we're seeing here. So if we were to just remove metrics B, C, and D, we should be able to see the same type of results. And that means that really there's only a relationship between metrics A and E and having metrics B, C, and D really don't change anything. It doesn't strengthen the relationship any more than what metric E already has. All right, now let's shift gears and talk about how to run the general linear model, or GLM, from within Minitab. Well, for the GLM that you'll be running, this is when you want to evaluate the correlation between multiple factors, where you have at least two continuous variables that you're going to be looking at, and you could also have some other discrete factors as well. And it's okay if you have more than one, I'm sorry, more than two continuous variables, but you can also have a combination here. As long as you have at least two or more continuous variables and any number of discrete factors, you should be able to run this GLM test. 
Now, how do you find this in Minitab? You go to the Stat menu, select ANOVA, and then choose General Linear Model. Now, the inputs for this test, it's going to look like a dialog box like this. And then you're going to select here is the response value, which is going to be your Y, your primary output that you're going to be testing against. And then within the model section here, this is where you select all the other metrics that you're going to be including in the test, which can include the discrete values or maybe even other continuous values. But it is important if that you at least identify for one other continuous value that you select the covariates button here and choose at least one other continuous value in here. So it's important that you at least again have two or more continuous variables. One of them is going to be a response, another one is going to be a covariate, and any other continuous values, then you're welcome to just include them within the model as well as your other discrete variables too. Then the test should be able to run just fine. So make sure that you enter at least one of those other continuous values here. Now the GLM generates a lot of information in Minitab's session window. So before we run through an example, let's walk through how we can interpret some of that results from the model. So how do we interpret the results for the GLM? Well, here's an example of the type of output you would see in Minitab's session window after you've run a GLM. You first of all have at the upper section here a list of all the unique values for each of the factors. So for the factors that you've identified that are discrete values, it lists for you all the unique values for each one of those factors. And then just like an ANOVA test, it separates out here each of the factors that are being evaluated where it gives you the degrees of freedom, the sequential sum of squares, and, and all these separate values that we had separately covered from within the ANOVA test. Then underneath that gives you a list of the coefficients for the covariate. Again, the covariate was the other continuous value that you're comparing against. So it gives you the constant value you're going to use. And then here's the coefficient that will be relevant to the metric C, which was um, the other uh, continuous value that was being used. And underneath of that, there's a list of all the unusual observations for within the model that it just highlights to you about. So what we look for in this type of test is we look first of all for the low P value that might indicate significance and we also look for a high F value which could indicate even more significance. So in this case we're looking at these first two, the metric C and category A, they both have a P value of zero. But the fact that the F value for metric C is so much higher than category A, then we'd say metric C is probably driving most of it and most of the relationship can be explained with that. And we'd also look for the R squared adjusted value. This is how this describes how much of the model can be explained by these tested factors. So in this example, the way you normally interpret it would be uh, we'd be looking for the R squared adjusted and see that almost 89% of, of these um, the relationship can be explained by these factors that we've run through this model. Well, according to this, it looks like metric C and category A have the strongest drive because they have the p-value that's very low. The next one might be category B, which has an 8% for p-value. The next it might be month, which has a 9%. But that falls within our rough range of typically a 5% for alpha risk and 10% for beta risk. So these could be something significant or maybe not. But for sure, it looks like clerk having a high p-value, we'd be confident to say it's probably not driving much of the relationship or is not contributing to the explanation of how the combination of these factors influence metric A. Okay, now let's dive into an example using the GLM. Well, for this GLM example, we're going to be referring to several examples within the Minitab sample data file that's provided on the website. So we're going to use several of the continuous and discrete values included within that file. So the question we're going to ask ourselves from a practical standpoint is, is there a relationship between the continuous and discrete values that we'll be evaluating? If so, then how strong is that relationship? Well, from a statistical standpoint, we'll state the null and alternative hypotheses where the null hypothesis is going to presume that there is no relationship between the values we're going to be looking at versus the alternative saying that there is some relationship, that is, where it's greater than zero for the R squared adjusted or the correlation value that we're going to be looking at. Now for the confidence and power levels, the confidence we're going to say is based off of the alpha 5% where it will leave us a 95% confidence level and the power level will be 90% which is indicative of a beta of 10%. Now the statistical problem that we type in the mini tab, it's going to start with going to the stat menu, select ANOVA and choose general linear model. And in the responses box, select metric A. In the model box, select the discrete values for category A, category B, clerk, and month from the list of columns that are available. And then click on the covariates button and then you'll select metric C for that value. 
Now when you run the output from within Minitab, it's going to create this type of output that we had just looked at for interpreting the data for the session window. And for actually interpreting it, what we're going to see is we'll look again for the p-values for each of these different variables that it was evaluating. And we'll see that metric C and category A, again, have a p-value that is less than the alpha of 5%. So in this case, we're going to reject the null hypothesis for those. And that way, uh, we would say that it's the same thing as saying we're going to accept the alternative hypothesis for them. And we can also confirm this by saying that there's a high f-value for each of those as well. Uh, we'd also then be able to look at the R squared adjusted value and see that it's very high at about 89%. So that would suggest that there is a strong correlation. So from a practical standpoint, we would say that about 89% of the relationship for a metric A can be explained by metric C and category A factors that we're evaluating. The other ones, category B, clerk, and month, there's a p-value that's a little bit higher, higher at least than our alpha risk. So we can probably rerun the test without those and find that we'd still have a high R-squared adjusted value. If so, then we know that those factors did not make a difference. However, if we see a great decline in our R-squared adjusted by removing, for example, category B or month, which tend to have a relatively lower um, our p-value, then we might say they might have some sort of influence and we might have to get more data to prove that for sure. But at least in this case we can conclude that metric C and category A seem to be driving most of the influence and relationship that we're seeing to metric A. Alright, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. I'd like you to refer back to the factors that you identified for running a lot of these different tests for the hypothesis testing. And for any of those factors that are continuous values, try applying the multiple re regression. Or if you do have at least two continuous values, then you can try applying all of them, even if you have discrete values, into the general linear model, or GLM. So if you have other factors that you want to include in your organization as part of this test, then feel free to do that within this exercise. Now again, before you run each of these tests, first ask yourself, do you expect there to be a relationship? And if so, then how strong would you expect it to be? Then after you run either of these tests, then ask yourself, does a statistical, test, a statistical relationship exist? If so, how strong is that relationship? Now if the answers that you have for each of those prior two questions are different, then how does that affect how you typically measure and communicate the relationship of those factors within your organization? So as an example, does the relationship between those factors affect some financial, critical financial decisions or process changes or maybe other types of critical actions your organization would take? If it does, then how should the results from the test be used to influence your organization? Such as, should it change how the factors are being compared, such as across different times, locations, or groups, or, or locations, or like uh, production lines, or geographic locations, that sort of thing? Or should it change how each factor is being measured? Or should they change how we react when they compare the metrics in this way? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.